In the next 12 chapters, we'll turn our attention to the nitty-gritty of how to work with a virtual set. But let's first talk about match moving on a green screen. Putting 2D into 3D is not much different from putting 3D into 2D, except for one very important difference. In live action, there are usually thousands of things to track, and it's actually a rare shot that can't be match moved, at least wide shots. But on a green screen, there's nothing to track. So we literally have to hand feed the software by putting something in. And if we don't, in case it's not clear, there's just no way to match move it, and the shot might not survive post-production. Most people know that they have to put in tracking markers, but most people also don't realize that match moving is fundamentally different from 2D tracking, resulting in shots like these that have plenty of markers, but no parallax, so they're not going to work. We'll spend the next two chapters showing you exactly how to rig and shoot your green screen. And the first thing we need is a great marker setup. We have three things we need to figure out. First, the color of the markers. The shape of the markers, because they're not all equal. And most importantly, the placement. We need to get a little bit technical, because they often have to be placed without any visual effects people on the set. Starting with the color, the match moving software would love for us to use black or white markers because they have the best contrast. But the shot also has to be composited, and black and white markers would have to be painted out by hand, which is extremely hard. And basically impossible behind hair. So we need a color we can key, and there are two ways to do that. First, to choose another primary color like blue. Then we first do a key to get rid of the markers. And then we do a second key to remove the background. The downside, of course, is that we have a second illegal color, which is frustrating for wardrobe and props. But what's worse, most cameras can't handle such a hard color transition. With the result that the key will leave behind these kinds of footprints. And the same happens on all cameras if the marker's out of focus. So colored markers can be a big mistake if the circumstances aren't absolutely perfect. The second approach is to use green markers in a different brightness than the green screen, and hope that the keyer will grab them. As long as they're about a half stop different, the match moving software can see them. The downside is that the ideal keyer settings don't remove the markers. So we have to crunch the key to get rid of them, shrinking some edges in the process. So the way to key them out is to first do perfect keyer settings, then do a second key that crunches out the markers, and then use garbage mats for each marker that gets near the edge. So we only crunch the edge where we have to, but key normally everywhere else. It's very hard to tell the difference in the final composite. Green markers have other problems. For example, that they don't look fantastic through shadows. But there are ways to deal with that, and we'll use green markers because they're the lesser evil. It's unlikely we'll find off-the-shelf tape in just the color we need. So we have to make the color ourselves and literally paint some tape. You need to use white gaff tape, because it has a rough surface the paint will stick to. Nothing will stick to duct tape. You can't use masking tape because the glue becomes permanent after a week. And you can't use laser labels because they're permanent right away. The goal is a green that's about a half stop above or below. And in Photoshop, that's about 20 RGB values above or below, and especially the green channel, but not anymore. To make these colors, you mix one part white paint into four parts green paint for the bright markers, or one part black paint into about 70 parts green paint for the dark markers. And then you paint the tape in three coats. 
we ended up using bright markers. But dark markers have a slightly more true color and avoid the risk of clipping. The next important question is the marker shape, which is an area with a lot of religion. There are some basic rules. First, that trackers prefer corners or pointy ends because no matter how the size changes, a corner is always a corner, so it looks the same to the tracker. That's the problem with dots. When they're small, they're ideal markers because there's no way to misunderstand them. And they're perfect for motion capture because they're rotation independent. But in match moving, markers change size a lot. Which makes dot markers fail because the dot pattern suddenly doesn't exist anymore. So people have first of all tried tape squares. Or thin crosses. Or thick crosses, all of which have lots of corners and can produce up to 12 trackers. But there is another problem that as soon as you see them at an angle like on the floor, Many of the corners wash out, and we really only get two or three trackers per marker. So then some people have switched to triangles, or triangles with an inverse triangle inside. And these are much better on the floor, because it takes more distortion to wash out their corners. But the fact is that all shapes have bad angles. And since markers are usually placed in a grid pattern, it's possible to hit an unlucky angle for all markers at the same time. And that's why some people have turned to a completely opposite approach, which is to plaster the green screen with random shapes at random angles. And this really works. For this course, we tested every known shape and color and pattern once and for all to find the best one. And random markers outperformed every other shape. They can be a little hard to see, which is unfortunately the goal. We'll talk about the exact placement in the next chapter. For now, let's talk about the overall plan for getting the best match moving. It's very important to again understand that match moving works on the parallax, and that means the difference between how the foreground and the background are moving. The magic number is a minimum of seven things to track at different depths that show a clear change in perspective. So this shot is fine. If a shot only has markers on a single plane, it'll either fail, or if you remember the discussion on jitter, extrapolating the scene from points that are far away amplifies the pixel error a hundred times out near the camera. And that's why the camera was shaking. And the 3D sticks were jumping all over the place in this shot. The computer needs both clear foreground and clear background to figure out the camera position. In wide shots, floor markers give enough foreground. But in medium and close shots, they're all out of frame and we're stuck with the background again. Remember that we can't track the actor because the points have to be static. But that leaves just a few points on a single plane, which is not enough. So what do you do? Well, you build two microphone stands with tape marks or post-it notes that you know will get tracked. And put them anywhere you need to beef up the parallax. The markers should be a different color than anything in the background, but it doesn't matter what they look like because they'll never be composited. This close push would be a difficult or a failed match move. But with the mic stand, there's a clear difference between foreground and background. And this is now a push button match move. To put it in perspective, this shot took a couple of hours to match move and composite. Without the mic stands, it might have taken days, or it would have failed as a match move. Then we'd either have to try 2D tracking, or faking the camera move, but we're likely not getting the shot we imagined anymore.
Other ad hoc sources of parallax are grip and lighting gear. And all this junk that often ends up on the green screen is great for match moving, so leave it in there if it doesn't interfere with the composite. And down the same alley, if you're shooting something that will end up as widescreen or scope, but you're shooting at full frame, don't do anything to block out the top and bottom in camera, like mat boxes or flags. Finally, your camera settings can actually make markers invisible to the tracker. Shallow depth of field. And motion blur wash out markers. And even if it's just for a second, in that time we ruin everything we've worked to do right. So shoot with the smallest aperture you can afford and a shutter faster than a hundredth of a second. 